Hello, I am Yogi Nisunita and this is Meditation, Yoga and Stuff podcast. I believe my dharma or my life's purpose is to share my understanding of meditation, yoga and Ayurveda, holistic healing science of India. I make these amazing wisdoms accessible and adaptable for present time. So let's start. Welcome everyone today uh, is amazing uh, guest we have in our podcast. Uh, Judith Lasseter Hanson has been uh, amazing inspirational yoga teacher for me. Uh, she, she has 10 books. Um, those who are in yoga world know her very well. But if you're not in yoga world, you must go through her books. They're amazing. Even if you are not teaching yoga, if you're practicing yoga, or if you're curious about yoga, I suggest that, you know, uh, her books, her speaks, uh, uh, talks are amazing and inspirational. So welcome, Judith. Thank you for joining us today. And I would um, like you to please uh, introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be invited and to have the talk we just had a few minutes before we started to get to know each other around the world with the same love of yoga and the same heart, really. So um, Judith Hanson Lassiter um, grew up in the U.S. and was fortunate enough when I was 22 and 23 to develop some arthritis and I say fortunate because one of the things that it helped me get over it was finding yoga so I by way of introduction one day I was I was in a master's program at the University of Texas in Austin and I was a teaching assistant and found that not very satisfying Everyone just wanted to know what was going to be on the test. And I wanted them to be curious about learning. Mm -hmm. So I was going to try to get another job for the fall. And I was walking along the street that every university has, you know, where there's coffee shops and quick food restaurants and bookstores. And <clears throat> I walked by the Student Y, Student YMCA. And it was as if a force pull, got a hold of my belly and just pulled me and I turned right and walked into that building. I'd never been there before. And I walked up to the desk and I said, you know, I'm a graduate student across the street. I'm looking for a part-time job for the fall. And there were three or four people sitting at desks. They all just stopped and looked at me and they said, how did you know? And I said, know what? Well, we just had a meeting 10 minutes ago and decided to hire a program associate part-time for the fall. Wow. So something pulled me in there and I got the job. Mm -hmm. And in that building, I met the father of my children to be. And there was a, I had just been started a yoga program there, an asana program, basically. And because I was staff, I could take the class. So the second part of the story was not only the father of my children, and now, uh, now we have nine grandchildren, uh, <laughs> but I decided to take the other class because I thought it might help my arthritis, which it actually did, because I wanted to dance again. I liked dancing. So I walked in. I thought that yoga was men in dhotis sitting on a bed of nails with a turban. <laughs> you had asked me, that's what I would have told you. Mm. So, and then I met BK Sangar and sometimes studying with him was like sitting on a bed of nails. <laughs> he was <laughs> such a strong teacher. But I took the first class and something happened to me mm. in that first class. Mm. We did Shavasana, which is, as most of you know, doing nothing. You lie on the floor in a position of relaxation and you purposely let go 
and go inward. And it was the first time in all of my 23 years that I experienced the, the understanding that I was not my thoughts. I stepped back from my thoughts and saw them rising and falling. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life forever. So the next day I got up in the morning and I just did what I remembered. And within 10 months, my teachers moved away and asked me to take over a class. So Sunday evening, I was not a yoga teacher. Hmm. And Monday morning at 10 o'clock, I started teaching Monday through Friday. I had 200 students in a yoga program. N no teacher training, a, a fanatic interest, read everything I could, devoted to the practice. And that's how it started. And then if you have the patience for one more story about the beginning of my teaching May I yes, share that? Please. Yes, please. Yes. So I was asked to take over these classes and my, in my, it, it rose out of my belly. It just came out of my, yes, of course. And I didn't think about it. It just felt so good. Hmm. Um, so I walked in the first day and I sat down on my little carpet, which I still have hanging up on my wall mm -hmm. with great respect. And my little rug, and I sat down, and there were 25 people there lying down, resting, getting ready to practice asana pranayama meditation. Hmm. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> what am I possibly going to say for an hour? Why did I ever say yes? And I actually had the thought that I could sneak out. <laughs> I just <laughs> didn't know what to do. And so a voice came to me that said, when you don't know what to do, just close your eyes and take some slow, deep breaths. That's, how, that's what I've been taught. Mm. So I did that. And I must forewarn you that every single time since I tell this story, I get chills up and down my back and down my arms. Mm. I call them truth bumps. Yes. It's like a validation. I so I was sitting there, closed my eyes, took some breaths, and right behind me off my right shoulder, I, I had the kinesthetic sense of my teacher, mm. almost to the point where I wanted to turn around to see if she was really there. Mm. And then her teacher behind her, and back into a line of infinity, into the mists of time, were teachers. And they were handing a bucket forward hmm. of water and they handed it to my teacher and my teacher handed it to me and I broke into this big smile and I realized I'm not the water I'm only the bucket hmm. that's when I understood that as a teacher of yoga the teachings come through us, not from us. And it's a direct lineage, person to person, back into the mists of time. And that it wasn't about me as an ego. It was about me of doing my humble, glorious duty, if you will. It was my dharma. I didn't know the word. Yes. It was what I was here to do was to be a link in that bucket, passing that bucket to, to give that water, that life-giving water of truth and presence, which wasn't about me. Yes. And I opened my mouth and I started teaching and I haven't closed it yet. <laughs> such a beautiful story and such a beautiful analogy. And uh, I really uh, connect with this uh, analogy of uh, gurus standing behind us. Uh, I always tell my uh, students uh, uh, who are becoming yoga teachers that it is um, 
it is really not about us. It is letting that wisdom flow through us because I have ex experienced similar thing uh, before any teaching I um, sit down and focus on the breath. And I also sense the wisdoms of, wisdom of the gurus uh, behind, literally standing behind me. And this is such a powerful thing because then it is really nothing to do about us. We just need to move away. Our ego needs to move away to let the wisdom flow and student receive what they need to receive. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and what, what's true for me, and I'm guessing probably for you and maybe some of our listeners, and this might be true for people who aren't yoga teachers, but they have something else that they love to do. And I think the same energy can come true. I think, come through. I, I think that teaching yoga is a privilege, not a right. Yes. And I know that every class I teach, it happens at least once that I open my mouth and something comes out that I didn't know mm -hmm. I was going to say. And I call it plugging into the cosmic grid Beautiful. and <laughs> letting myself be the bucket. Mm. And that I think that the two most, the most important thing, let me say it this way, that any human being can do is to recognize that we have thoughts, but that's not who we are. Yes. That we are not the narrow consciousness of ego. We are the infinite consciousness of being. Beautiful. That's who we are. And when we do the next step, first we have to recognize that. And everyone's on their own path, moving at their own speed to have that recognition that I am not my thoughts. They're neurotransmitters locking into receptor sites in my brain and in my belly because your belly has as many neurological sites and responds to the same neurotransmitters as your the brain in your head it's like the belly brain and that's where intuition lives mm. and but we are not thoughts and and that all the suffering that we have comes from believing our thoughts. And this is the teaching of yoga and of Buddhism and of many other wise paths. And so the first stage is recognizing that truth mm -hmm. and then remembering to remember it. Yes. So that for me, I have a book called Living Your Yoga, yes, which I wrote for everyone, yoga people, not yoga people, and, you know, I used to say that you could give it to your mother, <laughs> you know, you could give it to anybody. Uh, but to me, practicing in my yoga room is preparing the vessel. But that the asana, the postures, the breathing and the meditation are not the yoga. Mm -hmm. The yoga is the residue these practices leave in our consciousness which allows us then to turn and move through the world firmly rooted in our, I wanna say understanding, but that's not, that sounds too intellectual in the knowingness hmm. that we are the true self. Very well said. There is only one being and it takes many forms. Nama Rupa, name and form. Like it takes many forms and that I am a river of consciousness you are a river of consciousness. Everything is a river of consciousness. And I can turn my awareness toward form or toward consciousness. That is the glory of humanity. Amazing. Amazing. You uh, speak uh, yoga truth so beautifully, you know. Um, I always tell my uh, students that, you know, yoga chooses us. Uh, what we do with it. It's really up to us, but uh, we, um, the path of yoga is uh, people think that, oh, I'm doing yoga. That's not really 
What's being happening? yoga. <laughs> so I was so funny. Do you, you may have heard because you've lived in the States of Kripalu, which is a yoga center in Massachusetts. Yes. yes. So I've taught there many times. And one time I was asked to, I've been, I've given several keynotes, but one time in particular, I was asked to give a keynote at a conference. And I said, thank you. I'm honored. And they said, or I could send us the title, you know, in a mm. description so we can put it in the brochure or whatever. I think this was before we were online people. Um, yes. So I sent them the title. You're going to love this. Yoga will ruin your life. <laughs> and they wrote back and they said, uh, could you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> and what it was about is that yoga will, will ruin the life you think you were going to have so that you can have the life you were meant to have. Mm -hmm. And it will change what you read, who you hang out with, what you eat, uh, where you go on vacation. Now you want to go to yoga retreat. It will change your shoe size because you'll start opening your toes. You know this if you study with BKS Iyengar. <laughs> yes. you know, it will change so much about you on the surface so mm -hmm. that what is you can shine out. And that, I believe, is why we're on earth, to evolve into living in a state of connection and oneness with our true self. Because then we live the yamas and niyamas. You know, the yamas and the niyamas, we say, some people say the 10 commandments of yoga, starting with non-harming and not lying and, not, you know, not, not being greedy and those basic ideas that many, many cultures and religions have. And generally, they are presented as proscriptive. In other words, this is what you should do, and this is what you should refrain from doing. But I think of them now in a very, very different way, which is I think they are descriptive. Hmm. In other words, the yama niyama describes what an integrated person is like. They don't harm, they don't lie. They use sex with awareness. They, they're not greedy. They practice contentment. They practice self-study. This is what an integrated person, how that person can be described, which tells me that thought, if it's useful at all, for me, it's that it's what we do when we leave the yoga room. I mean, what are they going to put on my tombstone. We miss her so much. Her hamstrings were so loose. <laughs> I hope not. Because where yoga takes, becomes powerful is when we realize our personal transformation is not about us. It's about how we live, how we treat the waiter, how we talk to someone on a helpline, how, how we treat our family, how we speak to each person who is a part of this universal consciousness mm. and may or may not know that. Beautiful. So well that's where this practice is going. Sure. It feels good to do Shavasana and Pranayama and sit quietly. And, and I think it's healthy and wonderful to do these things or something like them that brings us in touch. But I think the real, if you know this expression, proof in the pudding. Yes. The real quote unquote yoga is not on a mat. Mm. It's when I'm standing in the grocery line. How do I speak to myself inside? Do I practice ahimsa? How do I treat everyone around me? Either everyone is Buddha or no one is. Now, did Buddha live? They, supposedly, I have no way of knowing that. It's a fact, but I, I like how I feel when I choose to treat every person I meet as if they were Buddha, hmm. including myself hmm. with honor and respect and how we live, how we speak, the words we choose, the actions we take, are they leaving a trail, a samskara, footprints on the beach of kindness, compassion, and presence or not? What are we choosing for the world through the actions and words that we choose? We have a choice in every moment. Very well said. Um, really, I mean, 
uh, you explain it so beautifully. And I think yoga is a lifestyle and uh, I, I, even that is very shallow. I, I can sense that because for me, yoga is, uh, is everything basically. It is in everything. And also you were mentioning about like how we, uh, yoga will change our life. Uh, <laughs> it's really true because um, what's happening is what we think is true is basically our ego, our sanskaras, or our mental impressions tell us. And we have this, we hold on to that uh, concept that who we are. And it's really Maya, it's just illusion, you know, and that's when, when we are on the path of yoga, we start to see the truth, the reality that is real. Uh, and uh, Maya is shattered, it's, you know, one layer at a time. And that was my experience. Um, you've been teaching yoga since uh, 71, 1971. That's right. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it must be, really uh, I, I mean you embody yoga i can sense that you know it is there in your speaking your teaching it's it's you are amazing yogini and uh would you please share some of your uh experience how um maybe yoga has helped you or change your uh your life uh, i would i would really appreciate that thank you well the biggest change is this idea of whatever thought I have in the worst of times or the best of times is not reality. Where are yesterday's thoughts? Where are tomorrow's thoughts? They don't exist. The only thing that exists is what is arising right now. Hmm. And for most of us, we're very lucky that we have the time and space and financial ability to take time out of our day. But even if we don't, we can choose to remember that we are greater than our circumstances. For most of us, what happens in our life are inconveniences, not true problems. And even if there's a really, which all of us will face the, the loss, you know, the death of our loved ones or our house catches on fire or someone steals our car or we have, lose our job and we don't know how we're going to pay our, pay, uh, feed our children or whatever. Those are definitely problems that we need to face. But the best way to face them is to be present and that because if, if we don't, if we are fighting with the present moment, with our mind, we're suffering more and we're not solving the problem of the moment. Should my mother get this operation or not? Hmm. The first thing to do is to go inside. Let's, let, let, let's, let me just teach you a brief technique that I think anyone can use anywhere to remember the self. Would you like that? Please, yes, please. All right, sit with your spine long. Slightly drop your chin. And in the beginning, do this with your eyes closed, but then you can learn to do it anywhere. So the first thing to do is imagine that you're moving to the very center of your brain, the geographic center of your brain from the sides, from the top and the bottom, from the front and the back, where lines from going inward would converge at the very center of your brain. Now release the root of your tongue. And just those two simple suggestions I think you will agree. I hope you will. It, you felt that when you move to the center of your brain, how much more quiet you felt? Yes. Yes, it is amazing. I'm I'm still there. So that's I know it. I know it. It's in, it's uh, seductive. Mm. And then, but when you add to that, releasing the root of the tongue, thought really 
is not there. Beautiful. There's just spaciousness in being, yes or no? Yes, very true. Very true. So here's the fascinating thing about it. Your tongue, which we know through philosophy as an action, as an organ of action, but the tongue is not just a muscle. It is highly connected to the brain's speech centers and writing centers and reading centers. And I don't know if you've ever seen a young child learning to write, hmm. how sometimes they write and they put their tongue out and they're moving their tongue. Yes. Like they're almost making the letters with the tongue. Hmm. I think that's universal hmm. because the tongue and writing and speech and thinking are so intimately connected neurologically. This is a physiologic fact hmm. that I find that going to the center of my brain and then releasing the root of my tongue. We can do two more steps if you wish. Yes, please. Yes, please. For the listeners who are driving, just to let you know that you can do this when you stop driving. So please <laughs> remember that. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. After you get used to it, you can actually be in the center of your brain when you're driving and your mm. eyes open. Yes. Yeah, but first eyes closed. Mm. So in a safe place, mm. go to the center of the brain. Deeply release the root of the tongue. Now imagine the heart, the lotus of the heart opening in all directions. Feel vast spaciousness in front of you, on the sides of you. Behind you, there is infinite space. Below you, there is infinite space. And above you, there's infinite space. It radiates from the center of your heart, the spaciousness. Finally drop into the basin. That's the pelvis. The word pelvis means basin. And this is the basin of life. The incarnation into form of universal consciousness lives and you can even feel the throbbing energy of life itself, the embodied spirit. All these line up, all these sing at once. And suddenly, silence is everywhere. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much, Judith, for that practice. It's really, um, I really sense uh, really calmness um, in this practice. Thank you for sharing it. Such a beautiful technique. And I think beauty of this technique is that uh, in few moments, you can really go inwards and calm your system down. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing that. You know, you're welcome, sweetheart. I'm from the South and we always call people sweetheart or honey. Um, yeah, that's uh, in Australia also. It's very common. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, this is kind of a radical thought. Can I yes, share? Please, please. A yes. All right. So we really don't need to sit in meditation for hours. Yes. The, the idea is not to become good at, quote, meditating. Hmm. You know what I mean? The, the yes. idea is to experience the state that meditation is pointing to hmm. and then live it. Yes. I, I, I think, Judith, we, I, basically, this is what I teach, you know, and I think we have been so much common in our teaching that it's amazing. <laughs> It's um, it's like, this is what I always teach my uh, client that, you know, you don't really a lot of time uh, uh, to, to meditate. A lot of time people think that, you know, I'll sit for meditation for one hour and that's the beginning and that's not going to happen if we are very busy, modern life. 
but it is a state that even just one moment if we you know uh, if you pay attention inwards our system calms down and that's the that's the beauty of meditation so and these techniques you just share like both of these techniques are such an amazing way to go inwards I really appreciate that and also i would like um if you can uh, speak a little bit about um restorative yoga uh, because um my personal experience that it is the most yummiest practice as i am <laughs> <laughs> they love it it has been uh, like my restorative classes are always full and uh, the reason for that is is because i think it, these practices um take us to from sympathetic to parasympathetic mode yes really quickly and i would like you to speak on it because your books on this are amazing and really give so much information but i would like you to also um talk about this here today i really appreciate that thank you you're welcome well i i first i like to make a joke like what is why do we need to say restorative yoga shouldn't that be a redundant term i mean what is the other kind of yoga make me crazy yoga <laughs> why do we have to call it restorative yoga in uh, when i moved to western world i started noticing that you know for me yoga is yoga but then people started um know, like as asking me what type of yoga you teach you know and it is this or that and i'm like i teach yoga <laughs> you know i don't know the boxes uh but yeah our human mind likes to put boxes around it and you said very well that yes it is a Uh, and why we need to term it like a restorative yoga it's basically we're doing the poses holding it for longer period of time with a lot of support so uh, but i would like you to speak on it thank you all right so my definition of restorative yoga is restorative yoga is the use of props meaning bolsters blankets pillows things like that to support the body in positions comfort and ease to facilitate health and relaxation and it really i started teaching it based on my work with bk sanger for many years and being in pune for mm. such a long time and uh you know many, many three trips there uh he used a lot of props and i got some of the ideas from him and then i just started developing it more and more and in 2001 i taught my first teacher training in restorative yoga and it has so taken off that now pretty much every yoga studio has what they call a restorative class workshops people have wait lists they call me how can i get off the wait list like i say so you're really agitated about taking this course in relaxation right <laughs> <laughs> they laugh but why it's so powerful especially in you know the developed world and the developing world everywhere in india and in europe and south america i mean us everywhere why it's so popular is because i think we realize on a deep intuitive level that we don't need more we need less hmm. and we don't need you know moving around is great in yoga and but where else is anyone going to get other than your class mm -hmm. of restorative yoga yes. the gift of silence and stillness and ease when when just being you and lying on these bolsters in a position of receptivity parasympathetic dominance all the cascade of stress reducing uh results of that just me lying there on these posters or you you are enough you don't need you don't you the the universe is holding you in this supported shape and you as as a container for this consciousness are the the universe is singing through you mm. and we never hear that because we're so busy moving and doing and multitasking well i've invented this word i don't know if i invented it but i'm promoting it unitasking 
Hmm. And so if you want to reduce your stress, try to do one thing at a time. Hmm. Try this. When someone speaks to you, stop what you're doing and give them your full attention. This works with families. P.S. Love Judith. Give them your full attention. Turn toward them physically. Give them your full attention. Even if it's to say, I'm sorry, I can't give you my full attention. I'm on a deadline with this project. Can I talk to you in an hour? Mm. Every human being who speaks to you, stop, give them your full attention. Because what is more worthy of your attention than a human being? Mm. Even if to say, no, leave, get out of my house or whatever message you have to do, do it with your full attention. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like it's about something for, for the other person. But really, it's about us. Wonderful things happen when we give, we stop and give something our full attention. And that's part of our dis-ease in the modern world. You know, you get on and you do email and I email with you in Australia and then I email with someone in Maine and then I email with my friend in Brazil and then I email with someone in, you know, Montana and then I email with my daughter in Salzburg and my mind is going to all those places with my email. Mm. So restorative yoga is taking poses, you know, usually for 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And just feeling ease because what happens and the reason, let me back up. When we use the props, people say, why do you use the props? Because it creates comfort. And we cannot really relax if we don't feel comfortable. Hmm. So the, when we feel supported by these props, it's this magical thing that happens we tend to universalize the experience of support. So we don't just feel it as physical support. We feel it as spiritual support, as mental support, as social support. We feel the world is rising up and supporting us in that moment. And what do you do? Because it's what everybody else does, but I know you do it. Tell me, when you feel really supported, what is your reflex action? Letting go. Absolutely. If it's financial, if it's social, if it's physical. So, and so what happens to people, they, they get into these poses and they're supported and they're so comfortable and they drop down so far and they rest so much that they lose anxiety because, mm-hmm. and we've studied this, like anxiety is always, it's, I call it fear light. Hmm. it's it's a and it is always about the future yes so when we're feeling anxious and so many people feel anxious it's always about the future so what happens is when you start studying restorative yoga and you start letting go and you don't feel anxious you feel present Hmm. and i did a you can find this on my my website, Judith Hanson Lasseter, H A N S O N, Judith Hanson Lasseter, under I think resources. I I've been an advisor, was asked uh, to be an advisor in a, in a number of studies with yoga in the National Institute of Health, mm. and the first one we did was we t- took a group of women and we did restorative yoga with them. We we had props donated. They took, I can't remember now if they did one class a week and then two home practices or the other way around, but they did it three times a week for 45 minutes. And we Mm -hmm. gave them props to use at home. Mm -hmm. And they did blood tests and they studied them over the course of maybe 12 weeks or whatever. I don't remember, sorry, the protocol exactly of the, of the study. Mm -hmm. But what happened to these people was their LDL cholesterol, which is called colloquially the bad cholesterol went down Mm. blood sugars tend to stabilize at least one or two people went off insulin Mm. their 
triglyceride levels, which is a fat in the blood we want low, went down. Mm. And all kinds of aches and pains went away. Indigestion and blood pressure lowered. And, and the doctors were a little confused because they thought, you know, they said, well, don't they have to be doing some aerobic exercise? Now, I like aerobic exercise. I get on my Peloton or I go for a walk. You know, I like sweat hmm. therapy, but it's not my yoga. Hmm. But I like it. I like to move my body around um, in that way. And they were, they were just amazed that lying there doing nothing caused all these beneficial results. And my, the way I just sort of understand that is the body's always trying to reach homeostasis, which is a balance, right? Hmm. Health is, is, a, is, a, is a continual shifting of hormones and thoughts and experiences and all of it to bring us to that dynamic center. Mm. And, and when we take off the agitation, the moving, the discomfort, the holding on, the tightening of the jaw, the clamping in the belly, all of that, and we relax and we, we let go into this position of ease, the body writes itself like you 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 the ship writes itself like if you're lost out in the prairie on you know riding with your horse and you're lost you just give the horse his head it always knows where the barn is mm. because it knows that's food you know yeah. and so the body is smarter than we are it's mm. incredibly intelligent and when we take the metaphoric weight of stress off the body it finds the balance point Hmm. Because stress, as you know so well, plays a part in every single illness, degeneration, everything of, of the body. I'm not saying it's directly caused. In some cases, it, it is. But whether or not it is, it directly affects everything. Every, every system, every organ system, every muscle, every bone, our brain, our literal brain, our mind, our mood. and when we can get, find in a consistent basis a way to become aware of our stress, it starts to let go and we become a vessel in which it's so much easier to know and trust the true self, the true consciousness, the true identity of our being. Beautifully said. Um... I can listen to you forever. It's amazing how. Oh, thank you. <laughs> how beautiful. Would you talk to my children? Would you tell them that? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Yes. <laughs> so I, as we're getting sort of near the end, I think I yes. have a an offering to give you and our listeners, our sweet listeners, and oh. you choose. Okay. Yes. I have a new book. It's my eleventh, called "Teaching Yoga with Intention," and there's also a chapter on being an educated student, hmm. but I know we have a lot of yoga teachers there. So I would like to read you the, the end of the book, the, a word to teachers. It's a page and a half hmm. about teaching yoga and, or I have, I write poems and I have a poem I would like to read you. So which would you like to choose? Uh, I'm so tempted to listen to both now. <laughs> um, let's go with uh, teaching yoga with intention. Okay. Part five, a last word for teachers, letting go of your students. Now, before I read this, I want to remind you of the story about the bucket and the water that I told. Because yes. it's going to refer to that. Okay. And the quote is at the beginning of the chapter, yoga practice and life itself is a gradual process of letting go. My students are not mine. Your students are not yours. All of them are students of yoga who belong to themselves. I once was driving a carpool with my daughter and two of her kindergarten friends. They were discussing, if you can believe it, who owned them? Needless to say, my ears pricked up when I heard this conversation begin in the back of the minivan. The first friend said, 
that, quote, we belong to our parents. This matched perfectly with his family dynamics. The second six-year-old child disagreed, adding, quote, we belong to God, which also made sense coming from that child. While I was taking in these two fascinating statements, I held my breath as I waited to hear what my daughter would say. She said, no, we belong to ourselves. I was touched and gratified that somehow she had formed this thought at such an early age. I was impressed because it had taken me decades to figure this out. Our students belong to themselves. Every teacher will have students who come once and never again, let go of them. Every teacher will have students who come for decades and then suddenly have the urge to leave your classes and study with another teacher, perhaps even study a completely different style of yoga than you teach, let them go. Remember we are the bucket, not the water. Gracefully send them on their way with love. That is the healthiest and most evolved response. Notice a ripple if it comes of disappointment or jealousy. Note any thoughts that tell you in some way their departure is your failing. These students have gotten what they need from you and may be off to become a teacher themselves and thus your colleague, or they may simply disappear without a trace. I'm always surprised and pleased when once in a while I get an email from a long ago student who drifted out of my classes. Recently, I got such an email from a teacher writing to thank me for what I had taught her 25 years ago. She explained how what I had said in yoga class had helped her in troubled times over the years. She wrote she could sometimes st still hear my voice in her head in a way that she enjoyed. Offer the gift of your teaching from the seat of your compassion. Celebrate that your student is not attached to the teacher, but to the profound truth yoga practice itself reveals in us. Always take time for your own practice and relish the experience of the subtle mind it offers. Know that your metaphoric yoga mat is always with you, unfurled in the center of your heart, awaiting you. Beautifully said. Thank you for sharing that. It's really profound, I think, you know. I can, as I said, I can listen to you. <laughs> it's just amazing. Wisdom flows through you. And such a gift you have given us. Really, really appreciate uh, that. You know, the listeners, I'm sure, must be thinking the same. Um, your book, this beautiful book, Teaching Yoga with Intention, I believe that it is not just for yoga teachers, but also uh, those who are curious about yoga and your other books like, um, you know, the myth, yoga and the myth and amazing 10 books you have. And I really highly recommend for listeners to get hold of these books because they are such a dripping with profound wisdom. Um, they will change your life for good. You know, it's really amazing. And Judith, thank you so much for your time. Maybe you can come on the podcast again and share your wisdom because I can't get enough of your beautiful wisdom. So if you <laughs> want, please <laughs> okay. join thank us. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to say you can find me at Lasseter or Judith.yoga. J-U-D-I-T-H dot yoga. Um, But I want to say something to you. Yes, please. You like my words, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. because you've already thought them in your own heart. Mm. And it's not, it's something you recognize. Yes, yes. And I want to appreciate you for all that you do in your own practice and living your own yoga and sharing it with the world through this podcast and other means of teaching and being who you are. And you, you and I are part of, if we can borrow a Buddhist term, a Sangha, mm. Mm. which is the community of practitioners and you are facilitating. And I'm lucky enough to be part of that right now, an invisible Sangha of people who want to recognize and remember. 
and I appreciate so much the time and effort, mostly unknown and unthanked, if there is such a word. So I'm giving you a namaste. And mm-hmm. I want to and I want to say I, I see you and I appreciate you for that. All the unknown things you do. Thank and you so much. I I want to give you a Judith quote. Yes, please. We think life is strong and love is fragile, but it's really the other way around. Life hangs by a thread and love holds the universe together. You speak my heart. You are amazing. And this is exactly how I feel as well. And your your wisdom is amazing. I think I feel like we are soul sisters. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are. (laughs) Because you know what? You know what's so fascinating to me, if I could just say here near the end. Yes, please. Yes. Is that one of the niyamas is samtosha. Hmm. And it's given as a practice because yama means restrict and ni means don't restrict. In other words, do. We are to do contentment. And that has always sort of puzzled me. How do I practice contentment when I'm in a grumpy mood? Or how do, you know, what does it mean? And this is what it's come, what I've come to lately. And I'd love to sort of end with this and share this with you. Yes, please. Is Contentment, Semtosha, is cultivating the ability to be equally accepting and even grateful, Hmm. not only the gains, but the losses. In other words, another way of saying that is there is a deep equanimity that comes when you realize to the depths of your being that every single action and word and experience that you have had in your entire life since you were born into this life has shaped you so that you can now be here speaking these words, hearing these words, doing this practice. Mm -hmm. Things that you wanted, things that you didn't want, all of it has shaped you. Every step, Every word, every experience, every person you've met, everything from your parents, from the moment you were born till this moment, we're all leading, and I'm getting chills, to this moment, present moment, which allows us to celebrate, recognize, and remember the true self. Yes. And contentment is the deep willingness to accept that. Not that I wanted to lose people I love. Hmm. But it has sh- everything that I've experienced has shaped me into the container I am. When a person starts sculpt, puts a, 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 what is it they call it when they're, when they're making pottery and they put it on the wheel hmm. and they take a lump of clay and they, they make it go with their fo- foot. They press on the pedal and it spins and they shape it into beautiful shapes with their hands. That's what life has done. It has created us into... This, on this wheel, a lump of mud, it has mm. created us into a shape, a beautiful shape that's open and, and, and that has, that's what happens to us. We get shaped by life, by the potter of life mm. into, into the being we are in this moment, the precious being. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, we give, uh, I think, positive or negative colorings to experience. These are just experiences, you know, and they are um, directing us towards our dharma. Uh, I believe yes. that, you know, till we are on the, our path, um, we will hit the cul-de-sac and the oops happen and we come back on our path again. Yes, and even the hardest things of, have, not that we would have chosen them, but Maybe on some level we did because it all shaped us. You know, last story really, but the the last time I was in India, Hmm. a friend of mine was there from France and some other friends. And he had stayed with an Indian family in Pune for a time. So he, we went over there and he cooked dinner for everyone. And it was lovely to be with his family. And I sat next to their eight-year-old daughter Hmm. and she, she looked at me and she said, 
why are you in India? Mm-hmm. And I said, we're all here. I'm, you know, I'm here studying yoga. And she said, how many years, how long have you been studying yoga? And I don't know what the exact number was, 25 or something, you know, whatever, some fairly large number. And she looked at me and she wrinkled her brow and she said, haven't you learned it yet? (laughs) And I said, no, unfortunately. And she kind of looked at me like with pity, you know, because to her, she's an eight-year-old. She learns subtraction. Then she does multiplication. Now she knows it. Now she's doing division. Now, you know, now she knows it. Hmm. And, And she was very literal. And it was just such a great question. Haven't you learned it yet? So I will leave you with that thought. I, I haven't learned it yet. We are all students of yoga. Aren't we lucky? Yes. May we live like the lotus at home in the muddy water. Namaste and love to you. Namaste. Thank you so much, Judith, for coming here today on this podcast. I'm sure the listeners must have enjoyed, you know, your beautiful wisdom. I'm going to put the links for your website and also those who are into social media, Judith, uh, uh, Instagram information. Um, uh, on, in this, uh, what we call it, like no show notes, it will be there. Uh, mm-hmm. Please um, visit her website. There, the books I highly recommend. Her books, also there are amazing resources. Judith also does online courses. Those who are interested, you can take this opportunity to learn from Judith. Um, you must have realized by now that how amazing reservoir of wisdom Judith is. So take this opportunity to learn from her. And I hope Judith, you uh, please come back again on the podcast and uh, maybe we can do a little bit longer so that we can go deeper into wisdom of yoga. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste Judith. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate that, that you're taking this time out of your day. Don't forget to subscribe. Take care. Bye for now.